This video was sponsored by Brilliant. What changes? This is probably one of the most important questions you need to ask when talking about statistics, economics, and the implementation of new laws, policies, regulations, and so on. Because things don't always go the way you intended. Like here's an example. Several years back, a daycare center in Israel was having a problem of parents showing up late to pick up their kids, forcing the teachers slash workers to have to stay longer than they wanted until all the parents arrived. So they implemented a small late fee of like $3 for anyone more than a few minutes late. After that late fee was implemented, the number of late parents went up significantly. This was a strange finding. So some researchers tested this with several daycare centers and the same thing kept happening. Now, why would that happen? I mean, wouldn't money be a universal incentive for just about everyone? Well, as we're about to see, it's not that simple. Now, $3 is a low fee, but that's not a good enough answer. I mean, why would the numbers increase so much? Well, it's because of what changed. By adding that fee, you have changed the contract of what it means to be late. Without the fee, it's a game of morality. A parent arriving late will only have to deal with feeling bad. They might say, oh, I'm so sorry I'm late, there was traffic, I got caught up at work, blah, blah, blah. And they have to face the teacher in person who they've held up and who probably wants to go home. Once the fee is introduced, now punishment is tied to money. It takes away the guilty feeling of keeping the teacher late because you've paid for that time, so it's all good. And at just $3, many parents aren't going to be rushing to get there on time. They'll accept the fee and can take their time now. You don't feel bad because you've paid for that guilt. Yes, it is true that a well-enforced late fee of like $3 per minute would likely decrease late arrivals. But the interesting part is still the fact that what you think would be a downward trend of fee versus late arrivals actually yielded an initial spike, which would probably come down later as you increase that fee. But this counterintuitive part of the graph is due to the fact that introducing a late fee changed the contract from a moral one to a financial one. That example comes from the first chapter of The Y Axis, a book I definitely recommend that's less math and more economics focused. Here's one more example I like from that book and see if you can get it based on what we've seen. This study had to do with kids collecting donations that would go to cancer research. What they wanted to test was whether a financial incentive would increase the donations those kids brought in. So the kids were split into three groups. In one group, the kids did not get any compensation. It was all charitable. In another group, kids received 1% of their total donations. But no, that 1% was not taken from the donations, and this was made clear. And then another group of kids would get 10% of their total donations, again, not taken from the actual donations. Now, which group would you say raised the most money and which came in last? The answer is the kids with no financial compensation came in first. The kids who received 10% came in second and the kids who received 1% came in last. This is also kind of weird. I mean, why didn't it go from no compensation to 1% to 10% in that order or backwards, 10 to 1 to 0? Well, it goes back to what we saw before. Once you pay people anything at all for the donations they brought in, it changes the game to a sales gig more than a charitable cause. And because people aren't only driven by money, the ones who weren't receiving money were the most incentivized simply by doing as much good as they could. What's interesting is that the 1% came in last. And that's because even 1% is enough to make it feel like a sales gig, but not enough to make it worth too much work. They're only receiving 1%, so I mean, they're not going to make that much. 10% was a big enough financial incentive. Even though it made it feel less charitable, it really made you want to get those donations. Still not as much as the first group though. So what this tells us is that if you are going to use money and change the game from one of morality or altruism to a financial one, then you better make it significant. Otherwise, just don't introduce money at all. 
make it a big late fee or a high percentage of donations because that's where you're more likely to get the results you want. If you introduce money but not enough, you might actually hurt the causes you were trying to help because you've taken away people's desire to do good. So if you ever find yourself saying, hey, why don't we pay people to recycle, donate blood, donate clothing or toys or whatever, it could be a good idea. This is not an exact science, but be sure to consider whether you might actually be making people act in the exact opposite way of what you intended. Now, moving away from examples of good deeds, this next one comes from the book, The Flaw of Averages, which is a more math and business oriented book. And it has a lot of examples of incentives within business. The one I'm going to talk about is one within banking. Because years ago, Wells Fargo had, and probably still has, an incentive program where if an employee got over 200 customers to open a checking account within the calendar year, that employee would receive a $1,000 bonus. After implementing that bonus incentive, the distribution of how many checking accounts were open versus number of workers looked like a bell curve and the 200 per year hurdle was somewhere towards the right end. So some people were selling more, but most were selling fewer than the 200 and not reaching that goal. Now the person in charge comes along and says, you know, let's raise that hurdle from 200 to say 225. Now, what would be the problem with saying, okay, it looks like now this many people are going to be getting that thousand dollar bonus. Thus, I can take that number, multiply it by a thousand, and figure out how much this bonus will cost the company. Now, if you said, oh, that's easy, by moving that hurdle, you incentivize people to work harder to get that bonus. So the distribution is going to shift to the right as a result, and more people will get the bonus than you originally thought. If that's your answer, then you are half right. See, the point of this video is not just to show that things change, but also that those changes aren't always obvious. Because in this case, after the hurdle move, the distribution was pulled to the right and to the left. It started to look like this. In the book, these are called the strivers and the divers. What happened was that yes, as expected, several people did become incentivized to work even harder to get above that new hurdle. But this was mostly from top performers, people who were already doing well. But there was another group that kind of lost the incentive to work harder because the goalpost moved even further away. These were people who maybe couldn't even reach the first hurdle, so after it moved, they just gave up. Now, could a lot of extra money have changed this? Sure, we've seen this before. But again, not the point of all this. In this case, the point was to show that the same incentive can cause two different people to behave in different or completely opposite ways. As the book states, the reaction to incentives from your top performers may be very different than those at the bottom. Now let's real quick see a much different type of example compared to what we've seen so far that has to do with cars with anti-lock braking systems. An anti-lock braking system basically just prevents wheels from locking up during braking. And this reduces braking distance, increases control for the driver, and optimizes traction during braking. So all things that would increase the safety of the car. And Learn Engineering has a nice explainer video showing all of this. But some studies, not all, but some, have shown that this system doesn't produce a noticeable change in overall safety. Like some have found that vehicles with an ABS were involved in fewer crashes with other vehicles, but more off-road crashes, resulting in no overall difference in safety. In a more famous study that took place in the 80s, they randomly assigned taxi drivers to cars with and without ABS and found no difference in crash rates, just the crash types. But these results were not due to the engineering of ABS, which does indeed make the car safer. What they really analyzed was changes in human behavior when you put them behind the wheel of a car that has ABS. Because what they found is that once you add this element of safety, humans tend to drive more dangerously. They drive faster, they drive closer to other cars, and they take more risk because of that extra feeling of safety. This is not limited to ABS though. It comes up in a wide variety of activities that involve risk, and it has a name, risk compensation. This says basically people change their behavior as safety levels change. There are tons of examples of this. 
cyclists being less cautious when helmeted because they feel more protected, or maybe someone with renter slash home insurance being less likely to lock their doors when they go out. So this is big in insurance as well. But I want to emphasize this because you can be looking at perfectly accurate data and statistics for whatever car crashes, bike crashes, and so on. But you can come to an incredibly wrong conclusion, like ABS doesn't help at all and we should just get rid of it, if you don't consider how people adjust their behavior due to a change in perceived safety. And last example I'll discuss, but one of the most important, has to do with economics, which is quite the trend on the internet. Things like minimum wage, rent control, taxes, and so on. Don't have to look too far to find some fun conversations. Now, personally, I took one economics class in college, so am I an expert? Yeah. Am I a super expert? Probably. But usually you need at least two classes before you become a super expert. So because of that, I'm not going to scream my extremely well-informed opinion at you guys, even though that would have been so much fun for everybody. But I did look up what the super experts thought of this stuff, like minimum wage. And what I found was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of differing opinions in terms of what the pros and cons would be. There wasn't a definitive answer. But if you've been online uh, ever, you've probably seen a minimum wage argument consist of someone saying that people deserve stuff and then someone else saying the universe will explode if we increase minimum wage. And just like, I, I can't, I can't with the internet, guys. And I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong. That's not the point of this. But I am going to point out flawed arguments. And one example that I really like from decades ago, which you might have learned in a microeconomics course, that pretty much everyone does agree was a bad idea, had to do with a luxury tax. Back in the 90s, the United States implemented a 10% luxury tax on things like yachts, private jets, expensive cars, watches, jewelry, and so on, in an effort to raise tax revenue. Now, I don't think most people really care if a $5 million yacht goes to $5.5 million. I think the rich people can't afford it. But you gotta be careful in regards to what changes. Because after just two years, this tax was repealed under President Bill Clinton. In fact, both sides of the political aisle agreed this tax was a bad idea. This was not a one-sided thing. Because there were a lot of unintended consequences, such as people buying yachts from overseas, tens of thousands of jobs being lost due to sales collapsing, and significantly less tax revenue being brought in than expected. And the people hit the hardest were the workers, the craftsmen, the machinists, people in manufacturing. So, not rich people. Thus, the tax was repealed, and basically everyone agreed it was a failure. I honestly looked up opposing viewpoints and really couldn't find much. Now, I know people in the comments, dear God, are going to be like, See, ha, that is proof that we should have no taxes. Uh, no, no it is not. That is a completely separate policy with its own pros and cons. If you're going to argue that, you should have a really good reason to. But I wanted to highlight this for the people who bring up these types of arguments of what people deserve. Because if that's your only argument at least, just if that's the all you're saying, then you really don't have an argument. You have goals, you have intentions, which can be good, but at least when it comes to the policies we've been talking about, not always, but with the things in this video, as you can see, intentions don't matter. It doesn't matter that your intention was for the fee to make parents arrive on time so teachers could go home when they wanted. It doesn't matter that your intention was for kids to raise more money by giving them a financial incentive. It doesn't matter that your intention was for people to only work harder to open new checking accounts. And it doesn't matter that your intention was to bring in more tax revenue. Because what matters is what actually happens. And what actually happens can be very different than what you were expecting. However, we should know that people with the opposing viewpoint often don't have the strongest argument either when they only point at the negatives. Whether there's validity to those statements is a completely different argument, so try not to twist my words here. I'm just saying acknowledging one side of the spectrum usually gives a very incomplete picture. As we've seen, there's a range of outcomes that can come from new policies, rules, or regulations. There's good and bad and things in between. You have more late parents, but you bring in more money. You bring in some tax revenue, yet you have job losses. Or you have people working harder and people slacking off. Often change comes with trade-off, 
and too often people against that change just point at the bad, while people for the change just point at the good. But you need to have that complete picture. Weigh the good with the bad and reason why one may or may not outweigh the other. Statistics can be confusing, I've shown that before. But the thing is, so are we. And how we respond to incentives isn't always obvious. So before you form your super strong opinion on the next hot trending topic, be sure to ask yourself, what changes? Now, if you like these kind of counterintuitive yet real world examples, you can find a lot more over at Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Their probability statistics and finance series you see here has several examples actually of counterintuitive stats and probability, such as with the Monty Hall problem and how probability changes when the game show host opens a door. They discuss the real case of Sally Clark who was sent to jail due to a misuse of statistics. They have the application of Bayes' theorem to several real world examples and much more. What's great about this series is you can start with the typical stats and probability topics, but you can dive into the applied probability, probability seen in the casino, the mathematics seen in quantitative finance, and something newer they added was cryptocurrency. So this is a great platform to not just get exposure to fundamentals, but to actually apply your knowledge to a range of real world examples, which Brilliant heavily emphasizes in every course. To get started now and get 20% off your annual premium subscription, you can go to brilliant.org slash zackstar or use the link below. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.